So it's my honour, and I really mean that, and privilege to talk to you tonight, particularly in this fantastic place, the um, National Cold War Exhibition. It's more than that, really, isn't it? It's a brilliant display of aircraft from, I can, looking around at the, the silver hair uh, from most of our generation, really, that we grow up looking at aircraft like this, at air displays and watching them fly. Um, I'm here because of Matt Lee, so if you have any complaints, please send them to him. Um, he heard me blathering away on some internet podcasts, which is a hobby I have acquired over the years and something I really enjoy doing. Uh, he heard me on uh, Omega Tau, which is an interview style podcast, and that really got me into um, the one that was on the board slightly uh, before, which is the Airline Pilot Guy show, which we do a weekly show, and I'm only touting that because although we're a non-profit show, we can always do with an increase in audience. In the audience today down there, I've got uh, Neville Bounds from Plane Talking UK, another podcast you might want to look at. Uh, there's Pilot Pip, who uh, is, does the Plane Safety Podcast, and I've also brought along a very senior Heathrow Air Traffic Controller, so if you have any questions about why you're being delayed yet again trying to get into Heathrow, <laughs> Adam Spink is the, man, <laughs> is the man to ask. Now, it, it's always nice to chat to uh, fellow aviation enthusiasts. We have so much in common. And with your royal connections, you guys and girls are definitely a cut above the rest, I promise you. I'm here mainly to talk about the policing of our skies during the Cold War. And I trust you'll indulge me, though, if I take the odd tangent along the way. Like some of you, I was born not that long after the end of the war. Unable to uh, find a way into civil aviation, I spent every spare moment I could with the air cadets. And uh, for me, the RAF was therefore a very sensible choice. Uh, the personal details, state the aircrew categories or ground branches for which you're applying in order of pre preference. I only put one. There was only one job I wanted to do. Now, my flying training was pretty standard for the time. Uh, started on the Jet Provost Mark III, moved on to the Mark V at Linton on Ouse. I always thought that was a dreadful name for a river. Uh, and with new wings uh, on my chest, moved on to fast jet training at RAF Valley. Ah, the, the hats were ones, uh, bowler hats I put on to those who didn't uh, get through the course. The halos, I guess you'll work out for yourselves what that meant. <laughs> Not soon after starting flying training at uh, Valley, I wasn't dressed though in a flying suit, uh, but in my full formal number one uniform, gleaming shoes, gloves, sword, and uh, we were in a small Welsh chapel. Uh, my sword was inverted, point down on the cold flagstones, my hands crossed over the top as we guarded the uh, coffin of a fellow student. Uh, the year was 1976 for the Royal Air Force. It wasn't a good year and it wasn't a bad year. The year started with the loss of a scout helicopter from 662 Squadron, crashed at night near Cross Maglen in uh, Armagh, Northern Ireland. Pilot became disorientated, he killed himself and uh, his crew member. Same month, a Wessex helicopter also crashed and sank into the Atlantic. Two Harrier fighters collided in midair during a target run and both pilots were killed. February, a Jaguar, a Jet Provost and a Red Arrows Nat were lost. March saw the loss of another four aircraft but happily only one pilot was killed, a Harrier pilot who ejected before he hit the ground, but outside the capabilities, I'm afraid, of his Martin Baker ejector seat. April was not good. Uh, there were five aircraft destroyed. One was an Argosy transport, which rolled inverted during a practice asymmetric approach, killing everyone on board. Uh, another two Nat trainers went down, they had a mid-air collision, killing all four crew members. 
may help correct the balance just a little. Uh, there were only two losses, unfortunately one was a Hawker Hunter pilot who lost control in cloud and killed himself uh, diving into the ground. June was back to normal with four crashes. Uh, there were no deaths, two pilots though were severely injured. Uh, July, August and September uh, accounted for 15 separate losses and 12 deaths. A Jaguar pilot flew into the ground during a gunnery sortie. Another was killed when he put his air brakes out instead of his combat flaps during a bomb toss maneuver and he failed to recover. A hunter pilot was lost at sea after losing control and another Jaguar pilot just failed to return after an exercise in Denmark. In Belize, a Puma helicopter went down following an engine failure in a forest and killed eight. I'll leave October for a moment. And just mention that the year ended fairly well with a quiet November and December only seeing one funeral despite two aircraft failing to make it home. Now October saw the death of my friend and fellow student. It was only his third flight on a NAT. The aircraft he was in uh, was mishandled during the finals turn of a circuit. And no one knows who was flying it. It entered a swept wing stall. Uh, it wasn't recognised sufficiently early to prevent them from hitting the ground. And uh, they impacted about half a mile short of the runway. Now in 1976, the RAF lost 43 aircraft and 27 personnel. There wasn't a particular trend. There were a variety of handling mistakes, aircraft faults, weather problems, foreign object damage and the like, but nothing that stands out. Military flying carries a risk, and back then the risk was pretty high. It's something that we took for granted, it was just the price for doing the job. We treated such events with the black humour that was common, and you will recognise. We used to write on the soles of our flying boots, dig here. This was a poster on my wall when I was a student. I had my fair share of interesting flying instructors. This Ray Pilly. He was on something of a punishment tour. He tried to get airborne in a Phantom uh, from Bruggen with his wings unlocked. He made it to around 100 feet before losing control and ejecting. Now my basic flying instructor, Mike, he flew gannets for the Navy. He made a faux pas when taxiing off the runway at Lossiemouth and he raised his gear instead of his flaps. Unfortunately, uh, the un undercarriage interlocks failed to prevent the gear from coming up and uh, his ugly monster settled down onto its radome whilst the props beat a tattoo on the concrete. Uh, when I got to the Phantom OCU, I was taught by Roy. Roy Lawrence, who shot down a Jaguar by accident on an exercise in Germany when he was flying with live missiles. What can I say? <laughs> flying the NAT was a challenge. It was fast and nimble with a roll rate that watered the eyes. But once we got up to speed, it was a great fun aircraft for our students to fly. I don't think the instructors felt the same. Their view at the back was pretty bad. At the end of our course, uh, we generally burnt the mess piano. It happened so often that the PMC, the president of the mess committee, banned it. For our graduation dining in then, a couple of nights before, we went down to a junk shop, bought a really old one, and substituted it for the real mess piano. On the night, of course, we said, we'll burn the piano, and the PMC said, oh no, you won't. And we roared out and grabbed the piano, Bought it out on the grass in front of the mess, poured petrol on it and set light to it. He was incensed. He called the uh, RAF fire section who came round with those enormous Thunderbird monsters with the big cannons and he said, spray those students. <laughs> uh, by the way, of course, next morning uh, we'd snuck the original piano back into its place and he found it very hard to punish us when the real one made an amazing recovery. <laughs> I might just point out uh, the very last character on the right hand side, in the top picture, he's there on the bottom picture as well. He was to become the chief of the air staff and is now a knight of the realm.
On to our tactical weapons unit at RAF Broadie and the marvellous Hunter. Our boss was squadron leader Hoof Proudfoot. Lovely man, he won an AFC for getting a Harrier back at night with a total electrics failure. Sadly, he was killed piloting a Lockheed P-38 Lightning at an air show in Duxford in 1996. Now in the Hunter, almost every cockpit was different, with switches seemingly randomly scattered around and often marked with a white hand-painted legend which usually had been peeled away. We had a kind of uh, rule which was we always moved the shiny switches and if they were dirty we just left them alone. <laughs> now the Hunter of course has a has a great history. It was even talked about in the House of Commons. If I may quote from Hansard, Mr. Stokes asked the Secretary of State for air, will he now make a statement on the loss of six Hunter aircraft which crashed in Norfolk on Wednesday the 8th of February? The Secretary of State for Air, Mr. Nigel Birch, replied, The Court of Inquiry has reported and shown that the accident was not due to aircraft failure. Yes, you heard it. Six aircraft in one day, actually six aircraft in ten minutes. So, I would make a bit of a joke about it, but unfortunately one of the pilots died. What could have gone so disastrously wrong? Well, the aircraft came from RAF West Radom which was the central fighter establishment. All the best pilots, obviously, went there. It was where advanced fighter pilots were trained, their tactics were developed, and weaponeering was taught. On the morning of the 8th of February, eight pilots from the Day Fighter Leader Squadron briefed up to prepare for their flight. They planned to go to high level, do a 4v4 combat mission, and then come back. The weather, though, wasn't looking brilliant, the Met officer said it was going to be pretty dismal. However, they launched a weather ship to fly around the area and see if it was suitable, and he came back and said that conditions were better than expected. So, at 10.50, eight aircraft blasted off from West Raynham and climbed to 45,000 feet. They did their training exercise, and operations had told them to get back into the overhead at 20,000 feet by 11.15, which they did. The GCA, the Ground Controlled Approach uh, radar, unfortunately was unserviceable at West Raynham, but their diversion airfields, uh, Marham and Water Beach, they were fine. So they were the nominated places to go to if they had a problem. The formation descended over West Raynham, but by now the poor weather predicted by the Met Officer had arrived. Without a serviceable GCA, the formation was instructed to bog off to Marham where the weather was currently suitable for a visual approach. They set off in a gaggle to cover the huge distance of 15 miles. Before they got there, the sheet of low stratus that had drifted in over West Raynham arrived. The aircraft were handed over to Marham, and Adam will love this. The cloud base had fallen to 600 feet, and the visibility was less than a thousand yards and getting worse. GCA approaches would now be required. Now, a radar approach takes time to set up. All I can say is that uh, the controller could only deal with one aircraft and, at a time, and he was faced with one mass blob of eight. He was at a loss. The aircraft coming towards him, he needed to separate them all and individually identify them which, in time, he did. He managed to get the first two aircraft on the ground without incident. Now, Whiskey Tango 629, he descended to 600 feet on his approach, but unable to see the ground, he climbed away and ejected, with the aircraft crashing into a field two miles northwest of Swatham. Whiskey Tango 639 did exactly the same, but his ejection was prompted by his engine flaming out through lack of fuel. His machine ended up a couple of miles southwest of Swatham. Whiskey Whiskey, 633 story, was almost identical. 
and his aircraft impacted a mile from the first wreckage. Whiskey Whiskey 639 got down to 250 feet, but still in cloud, he climbed up and like the others, he soon ran out of fuel. After his ejection, Swatham again reverberated to a crash, this time three miles south. The pilot of Whiskey Whiskey 603 was on final approach when his engine flamed out. Probably too low to trust his Martin Baker Mark II, which I saw one of today at the museum. Uh, ejector seat, he barely landed his machine just to the east of the airfield and climbed out unhurt. Sadly, the pilot of Whiskey Whiskey 635 wasn't so lucky, he died in the crash landing that he attempted. There's no report of how the people of Swatham felt when within, within a few minutes six fighter jets rained down on them. <coughs> Might have been a good time to buy a house. Despite the long lines of aircraft, uh, the hunters that we flew there were getting a bit old. It was a struggle to get big formations airborne. I remember walking out for a four-ship mission. Uh, we tried three times to get going, but each time someone in the formation went unserviceable and we all climbed out and had to start again. Eventually, uh, on the third attempt, we gave it up. And as we wandered back to the hut to sign the Form 700, to hand back the aircraft to the engineers, one of our number ran as fast as he could into the hut, grabbed the paperwork and put his signature on it. We all wondered why he was in such a hurry until out of the corner of the, our eyes, we saw his hunter <coughs> drifting slowly across the apron on its own towards the hangar and the office of the senior engineering officer. It trundled onto the grass and luckily being full of fuel, it sank in up to his axles with the nose just resting on the window. <laughs> Duly competent at throwing bombs at the ground and uh, not missing, uh, it's not very hard. Firing rockets at a very big dartboard and spitting 30 millimeter Aden cannon rounds at the ground, uh, both uh, air to ground and air to air. The ground's easier to hit, I promise you we set off to our operational conversion unit. Now, I was lucky enough to be posted to the McDonnell Douglas uh, Phantom II. The Phantom was a monster of an aeroplane. 20 tons of fire-breathing, death-dealing terror. The first time I stood and gazed up at the cockpit, some 10 feet above the ground, uh, I looked up at it and gazed at the enormous intakes, took in the beautiful wing crank and the anhedral on the horizontal stabilators. We weren't allowed to call them tailplanes. It was an American aircraft after all. I was both thrilled and intimidated to think I was going to fly this machine. The cockpit contained an imposing display of uh, iron instruments, switches, levers, all of which seemed a little too big. Um, and designed for knuckleheads with meaty hands. Well, after all, the Marines did get to fly it. <laughs> it had sharp corners on everything, and I was forever coming home with my funny bone tingling and bruises on my arms. I'm just going to point out the uh, white tape. Oh, I've got a zapper here, there. Around the master arm switch. Might come back to that later. The navigator's cockpit... Uh, wasn't much better, and apart from everything else, he had dozens of circuit breakers down by his feet, uh, for which, if he needed to pull one, he had to have a tool like a snail fork, which he could reach down by his leg and get hold of one. Uh, there's also a piece of a British tank fitted to that cockpit. I wonder if anyone knows what tank that might be. Centurion. Well done, sir. Top of the... Uh, of the uh, lesson, there it is. It was uh, a site, periscope site from a Centurion tank, which we fitted to allow the navigators to squint through and visually identify aircraft so that we could shoot them down at a greater range than we could do if we got up beside them. So the aircraft was built around the world's best at the time air intercept radar. It was made by Westinghouse. The AN uh, Org 1112, 
It employed uh, a pulse Doppler mode as well as the more conventional pulse mode. Now some of you may be technically adept and know what pulse Doppler was, but for those not, a simple explanation I hope will suffice. The big problem with a pulse radar, when you fire off your signal, bounce it off your target and receive it back again, you get an azimuth because you know where the antenna was pointing when you fired. You know how far away it was because you could measure the time it took the signal to get back. Now when you use that radar and point it at a target that was at low level, um, beetling around the trees like the Jags and Harrier boys did, uh, all you saw was the huge return that the world's surface, the Earth, gave you, and you couldn't pick out an aircraft. Now Pulse Doppler, with its ability to analyse uh, the signal a lot better, didn't look at the time base, it looked at the change in frequency that came back from the return. So you find it out, it hit the aircraft, let's assume it was coming towards us, and when it came back it was at the frequency it was sent plus the velocity of the incoming target. So it separated itself just a little bit from the Earth's surface. That Earth's surface we called main beam clutter and it was just notched out. We knew how fast we were going over the ground, so that was a relatively simple thing to do. So anything that popped up above was going faster than we were going over the ground. Anything that popped out below NBC it was going slower. So it was relatively simple to find a target. A slight drawback, we got its azimuth, but we had no idea of its range. Um, we could tell how fast it was going, <laughs> and usually we would do a little bit of Oh, the scanner's like three degrees down, a little bit of mental mass. I'll work out what the range will be, depending on our height difference. But it was uh, a fantastic way to uh, take an area to set radar into the air and find low-level targets. The weapons we employed were the AIM-9 Papa, or Papa. Uh, it was a stern aspect only, heat-seeking missile. Later on we got the lemurs. Uh, Generally speaking, around the time of the Falklands War, it was very kind of the Americans to suddenly make those available. The uh, AIM-7E Sparrow III, which was a semi-active uh, radar-guided missile, and slung in a pod on the centerline belly station, we could carry the 20mm M61A1 Vulcan cannon, a six-barrel Gatling gun that fired 6,000 rounds a minute. Yep, that's right, 100 rounds of 20 millimeter high explosive a second. Okay, uh, under the wings we carried two Sergeant Fletchers. Funny enough, I always never really question why they were called Sergeant Fletchers. It turns out, of course, they're made by a company in America called Sergeant Fletcher. <coughs> and uh, if we needed to, we could even bolt a bigger tank on the center line station to give us extra range. Now, there was a lot to learn and time was short. We learned the basics of intercepts and combat, uh, and we learned some of the Phantom's foibles. For example, when the angle of attack limit is exceeded, the Phantom will depart from control flight in a heartbeat. Uh, when it did, it would often end up in a flat spin from which there was uh, no recovery. If that happened, you just uh, asked Martin Baker to help you step over the side and pray that their engineers had done a good job that day. Uh, envelope protections were not something the Phantom had. The only envelope protection you had was in your head and in your hands. So at high angles of attack, the uh, spoilers that were on the wing that we used to help us roll, they were blanketed by the fact that the airflow had separated by the time they reached those control services. However, the aileron that went down on the other side, that was a pretty big piece of kit, and that went down fine. What we ended up with was a lot of adverse aileron yaw, which was termed. Now, when you yaw an aircraft, the nose goes across, and the advancing wing gets more lift than the retreating wing. The aircraft rolls in the same direction. When you get adverse yaw, of course, you try and roll the aircraft one way, and the aircraft either won't roll, or it will roll the wrong way. Uh, and if it did that, it often departed. So we had a little um, chant, uh, when it buffets, use your boots. As we try to turn the aircraft very hard at high level attack, we had to hold the aileron central, 
we weren't allowed to use the aileron, so the only way to roll the aircraft was to pedal it around the sky with the rudders, using that secondary effect of yaw, which was effective <coughs> but cumbersome and it didn't really follow a pilot's natural instincts. Course complete, we were posted to our squadrons. Now, I was posted to RAF Lucas, and the famous Battle of Britain squadron uh, first formed in the shadow of Stirling Castle with one and a half strutters. There's one in the museum, I was delighted to see. In 1916, number 43 squadron, the Fighting Cocks. My first flight was with our squadron uh, qualified flying instructor, Mr. Phantom himself, as we called him, the amazing John Abel. Um, downwind on my night dual check, there was a big clang from the left-hand engine as the supersonic ramp at the intake there surged um, while well, the ramp moved and the engine surged. Uh, I heard the clang and I looked in and the engine instruments on that engine, the TGT, the turbine gas temperature, was up around 900 degrees C, well above limits, which I pointed out to John and he said, well, you better shut it down then, hadn't you? So I shut the engine down and he said, we'll make this your single engine approach to land, shall we? <laughs> now, that aircraft that I'm in, and I have to say I was a very proud flying officer to have my name on an airplane. Not everyone managed to achieve that. Uh, that was X-ray Victor 582. I'm delighted to say that aircraft still exists. In fact, it's here at Cosford. Uh, it's over at RAF Cosford being prepared to be a static display, I think, on the air display this year. And it's now called Black Mike, which was a bit of an insult. Um, the uh, girls' school, Tremblers, three flight, next door, Travel One Squadron, uh, they got my aeroplane. I don't know how they stole it, but apparently they kept crashing theirs. So they needed an extra airframe or two, and we gave them Foxtrot, as it was then, and uh, my airplane went across the other side of the airfield to be painted some garish, shiny black and turned into a treble, treble one squadron aerobatics machine. The uh, caliber of pilots I learned from, excuse me from doing my teapot stand, I was a bit immature then. Uh, I'm just going to point out the name of the aircraft I'm standing in front of. It says Squadron Leader George Lee. So the caliber of pilots I had to uh, learn from was incredible. Apart from being a fine fighter pilot, George was thrice uh, World Open Gliding Champion. He was awarded the MBE, the Royal Aero Club Gold Medal, Britannia Trophy twice, and the Lilienthal Gliding Medal. Uh, not for his work in the Phantom, I might point out. Uh, I also saw him score a maximum possible score in air-to-air -air gunnery. Almost unheard of. What a guy. Now, training never ceased, and I had to learn several new arts on the squadron, one of which, of course, was air to air refueling. But we progressed rapidly through uh, increasingly difficult uh, combat profiles and intercepts, which culminated in what we call a phase three vis ident. This ends up with the fighter using just the radar to close onto a low level, lights out target uh, at night. Uh, there wouldn't be much point otherwise and uh, to stabilize in a visual formation and identify the aircraft. At last we uh, became combat ready and uh, the signal for that was to drink a very large op pot full of very cold beer, which we sometimes kept down, um, and more importantly wear the squadron patch on our arm. For the rest of the squadron, the important thing about becoming combat ready was you are now able to do your stint on QRA. Now, we had a major commitment in Lucas to hold quick reaction alert. We had uh, two fully armed phantoms. Uh, they were on 10 minutes readiness, 24 seven every day of the year. And at readiness uh, 10, we even slept in our uh, immersion suits. Uh, pretty uncomfortable there designed to keep you uh, alive with very low sea temperatures. Um, my personal record from uh, no notice, uh, asleep in my cot wearing my motion suit, was uh, uh, the siren going to being uh, uh, airborne in seven minutes. However, if trouble was brewing, we were normally brought to cockpit readiness. This uh, was where we could launch in under five minutes. 
The Cold War was a big part of our lives. It dominated our tactical thinking, almost to the exclusion of everything else. The Soviets had a massive nuclear arsenal and had already demonstrated their ability to build unimaginably large weapons. Back when I was uh, seven years old, Premier Nikita Khrushchev, he demonstrated the Soviets' ability to create a weapon of amazing power. It was called the Tsar Bomba. At the end, uh, they dialed back its potential, full potential of 100 megatons to 50 megatons, which is 50 million tons of TNT. So at half that value, is when they released it. They, were, they did that because the scientists doubted that the delivery aircraft would survive, and they were also concerned what they might do to the Earth's atmosphere. Now, Major Andrei Donovstov commanded the specially modified TU-95 Bear that was to deliver the 27-ton weapon. His aircraft had been painted pure white, try and reflect the heat from the thermal pulse. At uh, 11.32, as he passed over the drop zone, 34,000 feet, he released the weapon, deployed a parachute to give the aircraft a chance to escape. And during the, the bomb's three-minute descent, he and his comrades advanced the throttles on their bed of full power to try and get out of the way. Uh, and then, of course, the bomb exploded. The five mile wide fireball reached high into the sky as high as the bear was. The shock wave caused uh, the pilots to lose control and they dropped several thousands of feet. The blast broke windows more than 500 miles away. <coughs> Witnesses saw the flash from the blast um, and uh, it was visible 600 miles away despite the overcast conditions. Uh, the mushroom cloud boiled up until it was 45 miles above the Earth's surface. That's essentially the lower boundaries of space. The cap had a width of nearly 60 miles. Buildings in the village of Zaverny, I hope they'd moved out the local population, that was thought 34 miles from ground zero, that was just completely flattened. In districts hundreds of miles away, buildings uh, lost their roofs, had their windows and doors blown in. The heat from the explosion could have caused third degree burns 62 miles away. Window panes were actually broken up to a distance of 560 miles and atmospheric focusing caused uh, the blast damage even as far as Norway and Finland. I don't know who they sent the bill to, I often wondered that. The seismic, seismic shockwave went round the world three times and registered it at 5.25 <coughs> on the Richter scale. Now, old Major Donovstov finally regained control of his aircraft, but its belly had been charred completely black where the white paint had been burned away. And I think uh, had Chris Joss wished for a 100 megaton bomb being realised, it's little doubt he'd have given his life for his country. Now, not every QRA launch ended up in an intercept. Some were just practice, no-notice scrambles to test the system. The ultimate of these was to be scrambled across to Cardigan Bay, where the Strike Command missile establishment ranges were, um, just off Aberporth, there over the Welsh coast. Here we played as close to war as we could. Our target was a drone positioned out over the water, which we engaged with one of our live missiles. This was really to prove missiles capability, the weapon system capability, the crew's skill, and the fact that we weren't pretending to put up real live aircraft. So that was always a fun mission, a bit tense there. Now my first live Soviet intercept was a few days after my 24th birthday. That seems a long time ago now. It was on the 13th of September, 1978. I had about 500 hours total flying experience, and I wasn't yet operational, I wasn't even on a QRA mission. We were flying in support of a large NATO fleet that was out on an exercise called Northern Wedding. 
our American controller, since we were working under the control of an American vessel, uh, vectored us off our cap, our combat air patrol, and said we were to intercept some visitors from the east. I had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, Tone the Bone in my back seat became quite excited, so I assumed it was something good. He uh, controlled the intercepts and led me to a site that sent shivers down my back. Descending onto this large NATO fleet were a pair of uh, Tupolev Tu-95 bears, the first of which was a bear Bravo, which could carry the huge kangaroo at a surface nuclear missile. It's semi-recessed under its belly. You can see the outline of it on this photograph. By the way, these photographs, not necessarily of the actual event, they're photographs I have kept from those I managed to get off the, out of the photo um, section before they were sent off down to uh, the intelligence guys. Um, when that missile was fitted, it looked something like that. It's not one of my pictures, but uh, in fact, none of them are my pictures. The navigator had the camera. The uh, broad chin radar under the bear carried the crown drum, missile guidance radar. And training this bear was uh, a photo reconnaissance version. So that was a modified bear alpha, the original, and that was uh, not, uh, well, NATO gave them their own names. It wasn't the name the Russian used. We call it a bear echo. Now, for made in them was an experience I'll, I'll never forget. Four NK-12M turboprops, each produced 14,800 shaft horsepower, and they powered contra-rotating props with a diameter of 5.6 meters, that's 18 feet. Now, unlike most modern airplanes, where the prop tips are kept subsonic on the bear, they went supersonic. And the noise and the reverberations in our cockpit whilst we formated them on them was just unbelievable. Um, it could be heard and felt. It made our bodies and our chest shake. I was always gawping at the size of them. It was brilliant. I had a bit of a rough finish, uh, full of rivets and you know sharp edges, holes, ports, pipes, blisters, radomes, um, and the naked aluminium was just there on show. The only paint really was the bright red stars. Now we escorted the pair right through the fleet. Uh, an overhead USS Forrestal. Uh, which was there in the middle of the fleet, at a thousand feet. Now, normally we weren't allowed to fly anywhere near the uh, American carriers, uh, particularly when they had air operations going on. Luckily, they didn't at that particular moment, but they were very sensitive about that. But on the wing of these bears, the bears were going to do it, so I was going to do it. After all, we were the only fighter cover that the fleet had at that moment. Uh, the view, actually, was brilliant. Um, we hung around with the bears as they wove in and out of the fleet, taking pictures and just making them their presence felt. Uh, and with uh, tanker support, because we had a tanker there help us, uh, we kept up with them. And uh, up to that point, it was the longest sort I had ever flown, at six hours and 55 minutes. Uh, without, I might add, the piddle pack, which was something we usually carried on long trips. Now, once fully qualified, the live intercepts came thick and fast. It's just uh, random pages from my logbook. So bear foxtrot, bear delta. So four bear deltas. Uh, bear bravo, bear charlie. Uh, two bear deltas, two bear deltas. What have we got there? Two bear deltas. Uh, QRV live, two bear deltas. Uh, two bear deltas, two bear foxtrots. Gray live engine failure divert to lossy mouth. And two bear deltas. Bear delta, badger delta, something different, and a coot alpha. We uh, policed a pretty large piece of airspace. Uh, it was about four million square miles and went from there, northern France, all the way more or less up to Iceland. In some respects, we weren't particularly well equipped for the task. You've got the cockpit of a Navy FG-1 Phantom out there, and that's what we flew. Now, the problem with the ex-Navy Phantoms, 
where they, mm, they didn't have some equipment we could have really done with. Considering that I pursued bears across the Atlantic at low level, almost halfway to Greenland, um, an inertial navigation system would have been nice. The RAF version of the Phantom had an inertial nav system which worked to treat. Uh, we had a hamster in a cage um, and my navigator and uh, basically a, a map of the world on my knee and I would go along it with my thumb going, well that's 100, 200, 300 miles, that's going to cost me X fuel to go home. We did it by dead reckoning and hoping. We also didn't have an HF radio, which was something of a drawback, as I'm sure you realise the UHF radio has quite limited range. You need an HF radio when you're a long way away from base to be able to talk to your controllers. So generally speaking, we were working completely independently of command and control, which uh, is an interesting job for a 24-year-old in a fully armed Phantom facing up to the enemy. A scramble was usually preceded by a sit rep from Buchan, our sector operations centre, uh, up near Aberdeen. It came in over a secure line with uh, information on bogies inbound and an expected time to be bought to cockpit readiness. And that was our cue to have a pee and uh, finish climbing into our immersion suits. The ground crew would start the hoochins uh, to get the ground power going because the FG1 had no battery. If the tracks continued, uh, we would be formally brought to uh, cockpit readiness, both Q1 and Q2. Uh, we'd thump a big red button and a siren would uh, sound and the shed doors would automatically start opening. We usually got trampled by the ground crew who were going out to get ahead of us and uh, start doing their business. Uh, and then there was always a competition between the two crews to see who could get into their cockpits plug themselves in and check in at cockpit readiness first. Once strapped in, we now had a live telebrief line which connected us direct to Buchan, our sector operations centre, which was a cable that was plugged into the rear of the aircraft. As we taxied away, that cable would automatically be pulled out. Uh, the SIP reps would continue. Uh, perhaps they might tell us that uh, they'd launched a tanker from Marin. We knew all that was always going to take a while because getting those tanker crews out of the aircrew feeder was always difficult. We drummed our fingers and waited for the off. When it came, it was always very formal. Uh, Buckham would say, Lucas, alert one phantom. Our operations centre would come back with the Q1 call sign. And then Buckham would say, mission 57, vector 030, climb angels 25, Call back and find a stud 63, scramble, 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 acknowledge. Now, my job was to fire up the motors as quickly as I could, pull the power. The navigator's job was to write down the instructions and advise that we were scrambling. Our armourers would start pulling missile pins, arming them all up, and uh, the chocks would be whipped out and we'd start uh, taxiing. The uh, ATC listened out and telebriefed, so they didn't know we were already coming. However, we used to just say, scramble taxi, and we usually had absolute priority. The end of the runway was literally over there. Um, <laughs> problem was that we actually had very little time to get all our checks done. Oh, by the way, I know that's not a cue, but, but it's the only one I had uh, in reheat. Um, so <laughs> and there were quite a few checks to do. So we talked fast and uh, generally speaking, just did the important ones. Once we get airborne though, after the rush, first thing I did was then have a good look round to make sure I'd actually put everything where it ought to be, I had pulled out all the uh, ejector seat pins, stowed them properly, and basically settled in for the long trip. The nav would fire up his radar, start painting it, the ground, make sure it worked in all modes, and then he'd give a code word back to ops to indicate that we were serviceable, at that point, the Q2 crew would be stood down. They were hoping that we were going to be unserviceable so they could get the intercept instead. But no, it was their turn to climb out and go and have a cup of tea. We might hear that uh, an AW Shackleton, Airborne Early Warning Shackleton, might be launched out of Lossy Mouth. I felt sorry for those guys. It took them an age to get their thousand rivets in close formation 
up to the intercept area and we'd often pass them on our way home and they wouldn't have even got halfway there. Their old radar based on the wartime H2S was pretty much past it I'm afraid. Much more likely we would get together with a tanker who would be ours for the whole mission and if uh, we did we knew it was going to be a long one. We'd be handed off from Buckham, there just north of Aberdeen to Saxavord in the Northern Isles there and if uh, we needed to go up towards Iceland we might even speak to uh, Polestar up at the Faroes. Now they were interesting, they weren't formally part of NATO so they couldn't give us vectors to the target. They gave us navigational information which was just as good and they just didn't say your bogey's bare, they would say for navigational assistance we suggest you head. When we got within 100 miles or so and stood a chance of making contact Nav would run the intercept, uh, he'd give me the number of targets, the disposition of the formation, uh, we'd conduct the, cer the uh, intercepting search, we wouldn't lock the radar to the target, that gave away more uh, ELINT, more electrical intelligence uh, to uh, the enemy. Outside 10 miles we would do the armament safety checks, this would prevent an accidental release, accidental shooting down, we didn't want that to happen so we had the coolant off on the winders, we had the carrier wave radar off so that the sparrows couldn't guide and we had the master arm taped safe. Remember the white tape? That was the last chance check that we had that we weren't supposed to move that switch unless uh, we really meant to shoot someone down I remember mentioning uh, Roy Lawrence who shot down a Jagger in Germany with live missiles. One of the main reasons he did that was because the guy with the tape hadn't got to his aircraft in time and his master arm was not taped. Other than that, his aircraft would have looked identical with all the SIM plugs in the missile stations to a peacetime sortie or a fully armed sortie. Closing up on the target, uh, I usually felt a feeling of relief, of course, that we'd actually found them and we'd done our jobs properly, uh, and excitement, tempered of course with how badly my bladder was feeling. Um, relief that we had made the intercept successfully and, and I was excited to look the enemy in the eye. Our first job was to get door numbers. Now this might be something of a task. Um, particularly at night. Our navigators were eventually given a real old-fashioned uh, night vision telescope device, a real generation one, uh, which was pretty much useless unless the target had all his lights out because every time his anti-collision went through it, it used to bloom bright green and he wouldn't be able to see anything for the next 30 seconds. So what we would uh, do is uh, formate underneath the bear, pretty close, uh, as close as I dared and then I'd use the light from my anti-collision light to play up on the bear's fuselage and I'd gingerly move forward until the nav, looking direct straight up, could read the door number. Sometimes the anti coal wasn't really bright enough to achieve that so I'd just tap full burner and when the reheats lit the aircraft didn't instantly accelerate to a thousand knots, it would start because we're pretty heavy it would start cruising the aircraft forward and under the glow of 30 feet of flame you could usually get the door number. What the, what the Ruskies thought would be popped, up, popped out in front in full burner, I, I don't know, I'd love to find out. Now the Soviets would often change the door numbers of their aircraft to try and hide the number of aircraft that they actually had available. So um, our intelligence guys would use a technique called dentology which is why they wanted close-up pictures of as much as the airframe as we can. They would look for scratches and dents that would appear on aircraft with different door numbers and therefore work out that the Soviets would try to be tricky and change the number on an aircraft to uh, indicate they might have more than they really had. Now, I have to laugh when I read nowadays about this sort of thing. The uh, Americans, in fact a lot of people, have seem to have an awful lot of concern about how close a fighter gets during an intercept. 
I love this one. It says at the bottom, US has released dramatic in images showing the nail-biting moment a Russian jet came within meters of colliding with a US jet. He doesn't actually look like he's about to collide to me, but there you go. So how do they think I got photographs like that? <laughs> now, one day my nav was convinced we had found a new aerial on top of this poor chap. So the only way to get a decent photo of it was to do the top gun thing and do a barrel roll over the top. Oh, by the way, I don't think it was a new aerial after all. Once we identified the aircraft and got the door numbers, our instructions were usually to shadow to our PLE, uh, prudent limit of endurance. Uh, so now usually it became the very long and often tedious job of following our charges through their journey. Now, right for the nav in the back, he would have fun snapping away pictures uh, with his Air Force issue little neat Nikon, and I would look at the Soviet crew members and sometimes wave at them. The reaction of the crew on board varied enormously. Um, we often thought that if they uh, had the commissar, political commissar on board, they would just stare straight ahead, not engage with us, and someone else in the formation might be waving away and you know, showing us a, a, a mug of tea with a, you know, mouthing their Russian uh, toast. Uh, Nazdrovi. Uh, well, he assumed it was tea anyway, it was probably vodka. We would take photos uh, of them and they took photos of us. Um, we used to play a little game. Uh, as we got into position around the tail blister there, we'd see the guy with the <coughs> enormous camera, I mean it was huge really, come up and as he pointed it at me, I used to slip underneath and pop up on the other side. And we watch him <laughs> clamber over pipes, and, and then he'd get his camera out, and of course, as he pointed at me, I'd slide up the other That could keep us going for hours. Of course, occasionally we'd be lucky enough to watch them doing something more operational. Uh, a descent always heralded uh, something operational, so we would uh, close up into close formation and follow them through the clouds. Now, they weren't always happy to have us around. Uh, they were known to fire very flares at uh, intercepting fighters. Um, and at night, uh, they would shine bright signaling lamps at us to try and blind us. Uh, I almost fell, fell foul of one sneaky trick uh, when the bear pilot I was following as he descended down in cloud at night. We were going through about 2,000 feet. He was uh, starting a gentle orbit I was, as I am here, on the left-hand wingtip, flying him round. And uh, unbeknown to me, my navigator was busy doing something. He wasn't watching. I was staring out at the bear. Uh, he started to slow up. And uh, the first thing I realized, uh, and I was pretty heavy. I come off uh, the tanker, had eight missiles and full fuel tanks. First thing I felt was the left rudder pedal going mad because uh, at high angle of attack, uh, the warning that you're about to lose control of the airplane would be a vibrator on the left rudder pedal. Um, so uh, that started shaking and I suddenly realized I was pretty much trapped. I was in the inside of a turn at low level uh, and I needed to accelerate and I needed to get away from this guy pretty quick. So I bunted, straightened up, put full burners in and as I started to blunder through the cloud at night, the low altitude warning on my radio altimeter, my radar went off. Um, but we climbed away and uh, did a quick orbit, came in behind him at 500 feet and uh, followed him in and re-intercepted him, much to his chagrin, I hope. Uh, and um, he, we watched him drop his solar boy pattern. He was out looking for our nuclear submarines and uh, one of the things we would do would be to note how the solar boys were deployed, the time, headings, etc., etc. <coughs> now, um, sometimes when we followed them down and descended, we might find ourselves in a naval fleet. Uh, once about 30 degrees west over the Atlantic, we came down amongst some Canadian frigates. That was quite <coughs> exciting. A bit short of gas at that point, so we didn't stay for long. Now, Dave uh, from Trouble One, our sister squadron, the girls' school, as I've mentioned, Tremblers, um, 
He, he once tried to photograph up inside uh, the sonar boy bay of a bear that was dropping, actively dropping sonars. And uh, of course, the bear pilot pumped one out and it banged off his fuselage and tangled up on his tail. So there he is with the trogue of this sonar boy dangling off his tail and the sonar boy hanging on behind. So he thought, ah, I've got a prize. This will look great in our crew room wall. So he <laughs> set off back to Lucas to take this sonar boy home. And unfortunately for him, the uh, nylon wires of the drogue parachute eventually wore through and it dropped off before he got home. But Tremblers had a little bit of a reputation. Um, one Friday afternoon when we were doing our ground training, we heard a Q aircraft launch. Tre Treble One Squadron was doing their turn on Q and off they went. Um, this was Mac. I'll never, never forget him. Uh, he ran his fuel a bit low. He was up uh, well north of Scotland and uh, he decided that uh, he could run his fuel a bit low because he was going to divert to Iceland. But without decent navigation equipment, he really wasn't sure where, where he was. And when he decided it was time to pull up and head for Iceland, his navigator turned the mapping mode of the radar on and pointed it towards Iceland and nothing appeared. So they went, ah, damn. Right, well, we're obviously a bit closer to Scotland, so we'll turn around and we'll point at Scotland. Nothing. Uh, eventually, they uh, put a call out on the guard frequency and a sentry. We had those lovely AWACs in those days. Uh, they replaced the old uh, super constellations that used to be based in Iceland. And uh, he said, uh, uh, we're unsure of our position. The AWACs eventually found them and gave them a position and they went, oh, uh, we're not going to make it anywhere. So they <laughs> threw eight missiles into the Atlantic Ocean, followed by three empty tanks, climbed up to an economical cruising height and thought, well, if we head north, the sea is going to get colder. Let's head south. So they started heading south, bleating to everybody, saying, we're going to reject. Anyway, very luckily, there was an OCU tanker, Operational Conversion Unit tanker training task, and they were over northern Scotland, and they got the message from their command saying, oh, do you mind going and see if you can find this phantom? They managed to do a rendezvous, and uh, Mac plugged uh, with just fumes left in his tank, gassed up, and off he went back to Lucas. And we were all looking out of the window, as you do when an aircraft lands and you're in ground training and you don't really want to hear about how many rivets there are in the intake. Um, and we saw the Q mission come back with no tanks and no missiles. So anyway, he made it back to Lucas safely, just in time for his board of inquiry. <laughs> now some missions lasted many hours. Oh, I love that one. Uh, it's the same door number as my squadron, 43. So that one got pride of place. So some missions would last many hours. Uh, eventually, uh, knowing that it's pretty tiring being strapped into an ejector seat, no food, no drinks, uh, no way to relieve yourself. Well, there is a way, but best I not discuss it. They would uh, relieve us. They'd launch Q2 and he would come up and it was one of our few opportunities we had to take a selfie, which was rather nice. No selfie was more amusing, however, than this one. We were uh, on our own, escorting these bears well north of uh, uh, Hebrides, up near Iceland, and up pitched uh, the Black Knights. So the guy, US Air Force chap, they were based permanently at, uh, in Iceland, the Black Knights, and on his wing were two US Marine Guard Phantoms. They, they were weekend warriors and they'd obviously done, done a deployment to Iceland for a bit of fun. And when they heard that there was a chance of looking the enemy in the eye, they grabbed it and the, the Black Knight boy there took him, took him up and showed him a bear. Now, we were on a very discreet control frequency. Uh, we normally said very little. Uh, all of a sudden, we got these Americans coming up on this control frequency, going, hey, G-Mac, would you mind taking a photo of us? Uh, <laughs> oh, no, okay, if you uh, want. 
turn the phone, oh gee, uh, now this is my home address. <laughs> <laughs> At which point we said, no, 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 stop, uh, we'll find you, don't worry, we'll send you a picture. Now, of course, not every aircraft we intercepted was a bear. This was a very elusive uh, Illusion 20 Mike Coot Alpha. Uh, that sported all sorts of wonderful uh, lumps and bumps. Our Intel guys were always very excited to see that, including the canoe sideways looking radar they had underneath. We also saw a bison. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of my own bison. Uh, we knew uh, the difference between a bison and a bear because a bison's a big animal, so it would need four engines, and a bear's a little thing, well, relatively, and it would only need two engines. So bison and bear intercepted them both. Uh, I never actually saw it, but some of our guys did actually see them using this incredibly wacky Edoe refueling system. I, I, I don't know how they work. <laughs> they work. Now, occasionally we were launched for what was the very new, at that point, backfires and uh, blinders. Uh, I knew that was a blinder because the gen engines resembled a pair of binoculars. And if you look through those binoculars, you'd be blinded. So it was a blinder. But they never really came much past <coughs> Norway, which was a bit of a shame. Now, my tour on 43 eventually came to an end. I did a tour as a flying instructor and then went off to become a weapons instructor, uh, which was what I'd always wanted to do, never really wanted to uh, teach students, but they're nice people, I'm sure. Uh, and then I uh, headed off to a land down under, uh, which was wonderful, to fly the quite marvellous, very uh, electric plastic F-18. Now, after three years of fun in the sun, I was posted back uh, to RF Lucas, but this time, sadly, you've guessed it, to the girls' school next door. <laughs> so I had to do my time on Trouble One. Uh, we still held QRA, but now we're out of hardened aircraft shelters, um, rather than the old Q sheds, which had been torn down. And we very rarely got scrambled, because the world had changed. Aircraft I read about in top secret manuals with a few grainy photos that had been taken at enormous risk and smuggled to the west. Well, they were sitting on our flight line. I was even crawling over the cockpits. Aircraft that I might have excitedly intercepted were parked outside our squadron. It had all changed. Of course, things aren't quite that simple. With increasing numbers of Russian incursions into our airspace, a new Cold War seems to be starting. Uh, but personally, I'm going to leave that up to the youngsters. I've done my bit. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I'm looking forward to that.